Emboldened by my visit a week or so back to Prince Gong's mansion, I decided to return to the Hutong areas, and this time to explore the north side of Shichihai Lake, which I have only ever wandered along once before. Despite it being New Year's Day, there were men hard at work cleaning the white stone of the lake's surroundings, their jet stream washers making clouds of steam in the below zero temperatures. A little further along the lake, which had almost totally frozen over during the past week, was a man fishing through three holes he had made in the ice, while others spent their Sunday afternoon walking on the lake as if to say, hey, look at me, to their friends on the lakesides. Amazingly, there were fish to be caught, as evidenced by a couple of them lying on top of the ice a few metres away near another fisherman. In fact, further north along the lake, there were loads of fishermen sitting on the ice waiting with endless patience the way fishermen appear to do all over the world, as if there was nothing else to do with their pointless lives. I never ceased to be amazed at times what little mental stimulus some people put up with for the sake of their hobbies. Not that lack of brain power stops with fishermen. Despite the midday sun having warmed the air temperature to a balmy minus two, I counted not one but five different people togged up in their swimwear and jumping into about the only non-frozen part of the lake for a thrash around in the water. I have to admit that my first thought was whether the water had remained unfrozen there due to some sewage outlet running into the lake. Passers-by, actually on the ice, looked in the direction of the shoreline, perhaps relieved that there were others more stupid than themselves. Not surprisingly, the local boat hire company had given up the unequal task of trying to get anyone to rent their boats, as they would only have been able to go a few metres before calling it a day. But entrepreneurs further down the lake were doing a great trade in hiring out chairs attached to planks of wood, which acted as makeshift toboggans, propelled forward by metal rods thrust into the ice, or else doting daddies taking their kids out for a spin on the lake. There was even another spot where you could hire real skates for a mere 2 yuan or 20p, with a deposit of 200 yuan or 2 pounds, in order to slither your way around the lake. Eventually, though, I found what I had originally set out to discover, the house and grounds of what had once been lived in by Sung Xing Ling, also known as Madame Sun Yat-sen. It's a beautiful, unexpected oasis of peace and quiet, that contrasts starkly with the hordes of tourists that pass by its front gates, many of them totally unaware of what lies inside. Inside there were elegant rockeries and ponds, set off by pines and cypresses. Winding covered corridors link traditional-style halls and pavilions. In front of the house that has been kept very much the way she left it in 1981, is a lake and gardens that no doubt look a lot more lush than they do at this time of year. Water from the lake outside has been diverted through an underground channel into a stream that winds its way through the garden when it's not frozen solid. But even in winter their starkness is somehow quite attractive. I'm afraid that in my ignorance I had never heard of this woman before coming to Beijing. But Sung Ching Ling was one of three sisters who, along with her husbands, were among China's most significant political figures in the early 20th century. She married Sun Yat-sen in Japan on October 25, 1915. He was 26 years her senior. After Sun's death, ten years later, she was elected to the Kuomintang, or KMT, Central Executive Committee in 1926. However, she exiled herself to Moscow after the expulsion of the Communists from the KMT in 1927. At one stage, she was the Vice President of the People's Republic of China, and became the first female President of the PRC from 1968 to 1972. She again became Head of State in 1981, briefly before her death, with the title of Honorary President of the People's Republic of China bestowed upon her two weeks before she died. Apparently, one of her obsessions was keeping pigeons, a common interest she shared with Dr. Sun. And walking past her dovecot takes me straight back to my earlier days dodging errant pigeons in Trafalgar Square. Except here they're treated as welcome guests, 
instead of the pests they were guarded as in London. Inside the house you walk back thirty years in time. Apart from erecting some glass screens to keep the masses back from the exhibits, you can see the place as it must have been when she entertained international guests and spent her last years here. After the founding of the PRC in 1949, the party and government made plans to build a residence for Sung Jingling in Beijing and decided to renovate one of the Qing prince's gardens for the purpose. The grounds cover an area of more than 20,000 square metres, of which three quarters are devoted to gardens, ponds and lawns. It was first built during the reign of Emperor Kangxi and successfully occupied by various nobles and high-ranking officials until 1888, when Empress Dowager Shi Shi granted it to Yi Xuan or Prince Chun, Emperor Guangxu's father. He was succeeded by Tsai Feng, Prince Regent and father of Emperor Xuan Tong from 1909 to 1911, the last emperor of the Qing dynasty. Song Qingling moved into the mansion in 1963 and worked, studied and lived here until she passed away on May 29, 1981. Another of Qingling's passions was playing caroms, a kind of Chinese billiards which she played with her staff when not obsessed with her pigeons. From the dining room one gets a good view of a little courtyard garden that is surrounded on all sides by buildings that one can walk through at will. And there are even pictures of memorable moments in her life, like when she was lying on her deathbed and being told that she had just been voted the honorary title of pheasant. Golly, that must have cheered her up. So all in all, another memorable visit during my stay in Beijing, and another lesson in history that may go some way to lessening my ignorance of my host country.